Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest Diplomat webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about Mongolian politics, particularly the uh, somewhat exciting end to 2022. In early December, protests erupted in Ulaanbaatar, the Mongolian capital, and other cities. It was a demonstration of public anger over allegations of corruption by the so-called coal mafia that allegedly oversees Mongolia's most lucrative industry. After about five days, Mongolia's government announced arrest of some officials accused in the coal export scandal and promised to dig deeper into the allegations of corruption. Meanwhile, there were rumors that different political factions were maneuvering behind the scenes to play up or tamp down public anger. All in all, it's a fairly complicated story, but luckily we have three distinguished experts here to help us understand the current dynamics at play in Mongolian politics and what we can expect for 2023. So welcome to our three panelists. I'm very happy that you all could join us. We are joined today by Anand Tumortugo, who is a journalist based in Mongolia with bylines in Business Insider, HuffPost, MSN, Reuters, the South China Morning Post, and more. We're also joined today by Bolar Lakaja, a researcher specializing in Mongolia, Northeast Asia, East Asia, and the Americas. And she's also a regular columnist for The Diplomat. And last but not least, we have Dr. Julian Dierkes, an associate professor at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia, where he is also the Kenan Ren Chair in Japanese Research and coordinator of the program on Inner Asia. So again, thank you all for joining us, and I'm very excited to talk through the details of Mongolian politics with you. We're going to start by going back a bit to set the scene, um, and Anand, we will open up with you. Can you just give us an overview of the December protests and what has happened in the political sphere since then. Sure, so, so the first uh, protests happened in, in December 4th uh, on Sunday where uh, news of allegations of, as, as you said before, about, about, uh, about the coal mafia, about uh, embezzling uh, I don't, uh, around 12 billion dollars for over a decade or so uh, from from the coal exports to China and that uh, was seems to be initially uh, this protest was initially started by maybe some political groups but that was overtaken by um, by by, uh, by young people and just regular Mongolians who were outraged by this news and who were also uh, who also saw their uh, position in in society as unfair basically they're 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 basically because of the inflation and the current state of the world uh that they're not doing very well and then they saw this injustice and, and saw it as um something that 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 didn't make sense based and and so it animated a lot of mongolians to come up come to the streets and demand justice for for what is going on uh, in the country in, in terms of inequality and uh, of state of the country as as being livable, and uh, and so forth, and that basically continued more than um, I would say like uh, twenty days. But uh, the main protest, the, the bigger protest, uh, lasted uh, maybe less than ten days, and uh, afterwards the protest still continued on with very few people. But um, the, those protests were were quickly dismissed by the government, basically. And the government has uh, came with some concessions to make the uh, the company that was uh, named in this scandal, uh, Ernest Town to to have to be basically more public and to uh, show or basically declassify some uh, informations for, from the company's uh, businesses into the public, to showing that they have goodwill, that they will be doing things, and they will also uh, work towards making the company uh, uh, more uh, more open to, to the to the people basically they will have more dividends in, in the future I would say yes so has there been any concrete actions taken um, to follow up on the government's promises or are we still kind of waiting to see um, what's going to happen next 
so one of the things that the, the government actually promised is to make uh, like an exchange for, for, the, for, for the coal exports. So uh, previously what, what was happening is that uh, most of the, the, the coal, um, uh, to selling of the coal was named by the, uh, by the coal mines. They would name the price to when it was export. Now they're specifically trying to uh, hamper down on that and have a, a like a like a one export price when it comes out uh, when when the coal uh, goes to China basically, and that might increase prices of the coal maybe, and it would have more uh, oversight from the government again, um, and that's basically the promise at the moment. And uh, I forgot. When that will that be? It should be soon. They will they will enact that soon, I think. But that's basically it at the moment. And they've um, uh, appointed a new minister who would oversee the basically the the, bo the border. Um, uh, how, how can I say like the advancement or the improvement basically? And uh, those are basically the main acts that have been taken because there in Mongolia there isn't any like a. Um, opposition to the current government uh, so there isn't a much political leeway to change things to, to change the status quo in any significant way to have a, a, um, a legitimate change or some kind of significant change that will that will affect uh, uh, what is happening currently thank you anand uh Balor Anand mentioned that the protests were motivated in part by this general sense of economic unease, um, young people frustrated by inequality and a lack of opportunities. So could you give us a little bit of background on the broader economic situation in Mongolia and what was driving that sense of frustration? Yeah, that's actually a great question because I think the protest itself is a symptom of many social issues that are directly related to the economy itself. But as you guys all know, economy is a very big subject. But when it comes to Mongolia, everything turns in economy is like the, the umbrella, right? If you have all the social issues, so we could include inequality, unemployment, and of course there is mining, which well, what happens when you have a mining dependent country, everything, when there is a corruption, all these state-owned enterprises are involved too. So I think in Mongolia's cases, the economy and in relation to the protests is kind of complicated, but you're seeing layers of different, you know, different issues that people are bringing up because of the economic unsatisfaction, how they are reaching the people. And I think the larger issue is in a way it's allocation of resources, financial resources. And if you see the protesters and what they're saying, their messages are people are seeing that because this coal theft has been continued for 10 something years, it's, an it's actually an economic opportunity that they have they never had the chance to use them just because you know it's been like over 10 years. Um, that's one aspect. Um, another important aspect is you could see this protest as from people's perspective. You could also see it from the government's perspective, or you could see it from like conceptually, right? Mongo has been in market economy for 30 years, but is it really a market economy or is still sliding back to the welfare state? So I think when it comes to this economic discussion that in relation to protests, we'll have to talk about a lot of different things, but in terms of the people, I think they are just done with the corruption. They're done with the state-owned enterprises going into major corruptions and the people just don't have, they, they have not seen it coming. They, you know, they're not, they're not involved in it, but afterwards they're just feeling it you know we have lost the opportunity so i think this was really a symptom of major economic i don't want to say downslide but something is going on and that people need to know it you know i think i think this is actually you know tip off the iceberg and yeah um yeah that's why i really think but there's there's a lot of things that we need to discuss like break it down 
Now we'll certainly have more opportunities to dive into that in the Q and A um, and shortly. But uh, right now, I just like to ask: To what extent you think the pandemic and that economic damage might have exacerbated the situation? A lot of countries around the world, it was like extra pressure added on to these pre-existing economic and political fault lines. Um, you know, Sri Lanka is really exhibit A at the moment. Um, so, what about Mongolia? Um, did economic damage from the pandemic contribute or worsen these trends that you've been discussing? I think one of the major one is small businesses. You know, as as we've discussed, in, I mean, as I've written before, Mongolia, China has very, very large amount of trade. And when China closed its border, Mongolian small businesses had supply issues, right? So they don't have the small business supply anymore. So the price goes up and because the border is closed, they're not able to get their supply. So I think a lot of Mongolian small businesses went out of business. So because of COVID, the, the domestic lockdown also made them frustrated because not only they lost their business, now they can't even do anything domestically. And this is one. Um, for two, the COVID, um, really made people, I think the lockdown itself really made people realize that the government was not doing enough for like providing economic opportunity. And it's not just the border closure with China, right? Because if the opportunity was there, the, the people would be willing to take advantage of it. So I think the frustration is really based on the opportunity and the government is just not willing to like open it up. Um, and I think COVID just kind of like made people realize, you know what, like we have one border shut down and, you know, we're out of business, our lives are ruined. So I think that really, really made people, you know, they were just, they're frustrated and they don't have the opportunity. That's what I think. Thank you, Galore. Again, I, please, um, audience members, be thinking of questions to put in our Q&A box in just a little bit. But first, I'm going to turn to Julian to round out our opening discussion. Um, as Anand mentioned, there were rumors that political groups were behind the protests, at least initially. Uh, there are tons of rumors about political infighting within the ruling Mongolian People's Party. And as Anand mentioned also, the scope for political opposition is limited given the MPP's dominance of the legislature and presidency. So I think we really need a scene setter to help us understand the political context in Mongolia at the time of the protests and what strands were feeding into it. So Julian, can you just give us a little bit of background about what might've been going on behind the scenes? Great, I'll certainly try, Shannon. And I'll uh, riff off what Bola just said, uh, the protest as a, as a symptom of social issues and focus on the political version of that, which is another dimension in addition to the economic version. Um, and, and maybe start as, a, as just a bit of, yeah, like, like you said, setting the scene, uh, what about democracy in Mongolia? And so it's been just like the market economy, it's been 30 years. Um, it's been a relatively stable democracy in terms of the party system. Uh, we, we've had, we have a, a set of two parties um, one of which existed for the 70 previous years under the state socialist period and is now called the Mongolian People's Party. The other party, the Democratic Party, emerged from um, the, the sort of the counter-government revolution and protests uh, in 1990. You can already take note, we have a history of protests here as well, uh, but that have led to a revolution only in 1921 and in 1990. Um, and then some upstart parties and some other parties along the way. So a relative sta relatively stable party system. It's been going for 30 years, regular elections, parliamentary elections every four years. Last one was in 2020. Presidential elections used to be every four years as well. Last one was in 2021, although it's shifting to a six year term now. So the next would be not until 2027. Uh, we've had several peaceful turnovers in government. One of the markers that many people use for a functioning democracy Elections matter, they lead to new governments. And so all of that is to say, uh, by most of the sort of structural, um, by, if you have a checklist, you would say, yeah, Mongolia doing well, um, particularly in, a, in an era when uh, we see democratic backsliding around the world and, and see that as a challenge, uh, and particularly in an area and a neighborhood that is not particularly friendly to, to democracy. And so that's sort of a place to start. Another piece that's important to that is the engaged civil society. 
like I mentioned, 1990, the change in government was brought about by protests ultimately. And we've had protests uh, all throughout the democratic period. Uh, kind of interestingly, they tend to happen at, in spring, at the end of winter, as the country sort of thaws from, from deep freeze. These last couple of years, we've had um, a December and January protests. So um, maybe speaking a little bit to the urgency of some of these protests, uh, because if you've been in Mongolia in, in December and January, it's, it's not an obvious time to be outside uh, and spending a lot of time standing around. Uh, just because it's very cold. And so um, just a bit more than on the party system, because it is like you asked about sort of the, the infighting within the party that might be causing some of this. So let's think about that for a moment. There were some fears um, from 2016 on the Mongolian People's Party has dominated parliament has won decisive victories in the 16 and 20 elections uh, and, and hold super majorities. Um, and so in the last election in 2020, the MPP won 62 of 76 seats. And so in many ways, you could say they can do anything they want. Uh, and lots of people, in fact, had some fears that we're looking at an emerging or a transitioning one party state. But I think what's a bit more accurate actually is the no party state, because we have these parties that are political organizations have a big membership, certainly the MPP does, but the DP as well, and we've got some newer parties, but they are not distinguished by any ideological positions or policy positions. Uh, and that shows up in some of these protests uh, at the moment uh, as well. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But, but we've got parties that don't necessarily function as a way for voters to express their views on the future of the country. But they're mostly elections that allow voters a chance to elect the people involved but without necessarily knowing what these people will do with the power they will hold. And so in that sense, it's a no party system because the parties don't necessarily represent points of view, political directions, preferences, uh, so much as they do choices about leadership. That has led to, and, and this is increasing in the last couple of years, and Anand talked a bit about the, the prominence of younger uh, Mongolians in some of these protests. I think a lot of that, those, those features of the party system has led to a sense of exclusion, of political exclusion by some parts of the population. That, that there's a lot of talk about democracy and yes, people are able to vote, but there really isn't a strong sense that Mongolians actually have a vote in the future of the country. They pick people, but they don't determine the direction. Lots of people also who are maybe affiliated with one of the newer parties that calls itself the National Labour Party in English um, and is an upstart that's been going with some uh, energy and some enthusiasm for something like five, six, seven years, they also talk about how the political system is closed off to a new party. And so there's this general sense that, yes, there's a functioning democracy, but it's not one that's necessarily open to input from the population and particularly for younger people. And so that has led to a lot of these, these frustrations that Boller also talked about in terms of social policies, as you asked Janet and mentioned, exacerbated by, by COVID that has sort of brought some of these challenges to a point where the government has said, yes, we will take care of you. Uh, we will take care of you through COVID and the like. But then a lot of people are saying, well, have you? Are you delivering on some of those promises? And that's what we saw in a lot of the protests, I think, in December, as, as Anand described them as well, that people are asking that question is, it's nice for you to make these promises, but we don't actually feel that taken care of in the end. And you're also, some of the people affiliated with the government seem to be stealing a lot of the money. And that links back to, to one of the areas that really politics hasn't been the arena to discuss is one that, that Bolo mentioned, which is the prevalence of state-owned enterprises. There, there hasn't been much of a discussion along the way that says, do we want a market economy that has significantly, uh, significant numbers of publicly owned actors? That's particularly um, prominent in the mining sector, but you could talk about prominent businesses like MIAT, the National Airways, that's still, that's, that's still a, a state-owned enterprise in many ways, and a number of others. And so that debate hasn't quite happened. What, what is this economy that we're trying to build? Is there a reason why the mining sector in particular should have more state involvement? That's been an argument in the past. So there's a requirement that strategic deposits actually have to have some state share. Um, but that debate hasn't really happened. And because it doesn't happen in the political sphere, I think a lot of people get frustrated with that and say, well, you know, we thought we we're going to be a market economy, but here we've got all these state enterprises and now they're actually stealing money. So the allegation goes. Uh, we'll see how some of the reporting goes there, but that's some of the allegations. 
Now, what you asked about to start off where I was going with this, Shannon, is, is so what was happening in December? So on December, the morning of December 5th, as I sort of heard, here's protest, most people that I checked in with contacts in Mongolia said, ah, you know, the president is trying to orchestrate something ahead of the party meeting. Why well, I get frustrated with that explanation, because what it does in a democracy it leaves no space for genuine political engagement. And I think, as Anand also described it, what we actually saw in these protests lasting 10 years, uh, 10 days so far, uh, not 10 years, but uh, lasting a, a relatively long while, but also not really producing an organization or a social movement, which meant that they fizzled. But it also meant that I think this explanation of this was just some political machinations where someone was trying to grab power. I'm just not persuaded. I, I think politicians make use of these events as they do anywhere in the world and say, oh, I'm, I'm with the protesters, right? Um, but I think these were actually genuine expressions of protests and they come on the heel of protests we saw two years ago um, that led that now President Hubertsoch, when he was prime minister, claimed led him to resign. I wasn't quite so persuaded, but that was in January two years ago. And then we saw protests last April uh, that were that involved seemed like similar people as we did see them now in December. And, and these do to me seem like genuine expressions uh, or as, as Boller called it, symptoms of social issues. And so this explanation that there's all you know, conspiracies and these are just political actors sort of playing, playing a, a big game of chess, um, I don't find terribly persuasive. And I'm rather look to this lack of, of ideological debate, of policy debate in, in the political sphere and the, the party system is one of the causes. So uh, just to provide a little bit more context, and we actually had an audience question about this right before you started getting into it. Um, it assuming that the rumors of President Kurosak orchestrating these protests you know, were flying around, as you said, uh, what's his motive for doing that? Uh, what's his relationship with the prime minister who's kind of seen as his rival? Can you just ex explain a little bit more about why people were suspicious about this and what are the dynamics at play there? Well, so that's an interesting one. And Anand and Bola might have a different take on this than I do. But um, so Hurezo was prime minister before, was party leader. Um, I'd say uh, not a particularly distinguished uh, politician as a prime minister. Uh, I, I don't think that I could name a particular sort of substantive initiative that he was associated with. Um, one of the things that worried me a little bit about his campaign uh, and the prospect of having an MPP uh, president along with an MPP government is that I, I just wasn't really sure why he wanted to be president. And so you kind of worry about this, this uh, just sense of wanting to be in power. Uh, and so that's broadly was my take on, on Huitzoch. Then Oyen Aden, the current prime minister, was um, cabinet secretary under Huitzoch before, has been long involved in government um, in the MPP, uh, is of a slightly younger generation. And Bolo and I wrote a piece some years ago sort of celebrating the fact that there was a younger generation coming in and, and hoping that it would lead to some change. I think, Bolo, we've both been a little bit disappointed with, with the lack of change. But to me, the, they, uh, they don't look like rivals to me because they, they're both uh, skillful party and politics managers that have gone alongside. Now, Hurezo is in a position where the constitution has been changed. So he only has one term. It's six years. It's, so the next election is not till 2027. He really doesn't have to think about elections. He's just kind of thinking about the kind of presidency he's leading. Now, he wants to obviously maintain a little bit of control and say in the People's Party, because that's where he's come from as a party. And so he, he remains in party politics. But to me, this idea that he, he's somehow arranging things to, to oust Ulyan Erden and replace him with someone else, I, I'm not entirely sure that I'm persuaded that there's much purpose to that. Now, we know that in politics, that doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't happen. There's egos involved and there's concept of other things. But I just find it hard to see a rationale that thinks about this as primarily a battle between these two leaders. Having said that, I don't think Oyen Aden is going to make it to the next election. And so in that sense, I mean, there'll, there'll probably be a new prime minister and, and party leader, and we might think of some candidates for that. And there are some rivalries involved, but not this kind of, you know, fighting for control of the party. I just don't quite see the purpose. Thanks. Um, Anand, would you like to chime in? I'm interested to hear your take to see if it's similar or different from Julian's. 
Um, no, I, I, I agree with the, most of the things that Julian have said about Hulsuk uh, and uh, Oyunurden. Oyunurden and Hulsuk basically came from uh, the same camp, and um, uh, there might be some rivalry between them, but uh, there's hard to parse out what there is. And there was indications from from the president that uh, he wanted to uh, dissolve the government dissolve uh, the, the, the parliament. But if he has the power within his party, it, that would have happened, but it didn't. So there might be some kind of pushback from him now that he's maybe because he's president, he does not really have full control of, um, uh, of the government or from, or from his party. And basically maybe his faction that used to be strong, uh, maybe maybe now it's, it's, it, it isn't as, as strong uh, that even if he, he indicated that he wanted uh, this parliament, this government to be dissolved. It didn't happen. So it shows that maybe he, he is overstepping bounds or maybe he's just um, trying to, um, like, he, he's just peacocking, basically. He's, he's just trying to say, like, I want this, I want that, but he does not really have <clears throat> that much of a power within, within his own party at the moment. And uh, maybe, again, I, would, I don't, I cannot, uh, the only thing I can speculate is, is maybe there is some infighting between uh, Hrusuk and Oyurtin, but uh, at the moment there there's very little indication of, of that happening. There was a, there was a news report from uh, from Urdu Point that uh, that the, the current government from Oyurtin's government wanted to make uh, Mongolia a full parliament parliamentary system and dissolving the presidency, but I have not seen any other. Um, uh, news reports or public statements on that. So uh, uh, there's basically, uh, how can I say, like n nothing much between the, 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 the rivalries between Khurusuk and Ayurveda and that's, uh, that's grand, basically. All right, Bolo, did you want to add on to anything on this aspect or should we move on to another question? We can move on, thank you. Okay. Uh, so we have a question from Roseanne Guerin of Radio Free Asia about the Chinese government's reaction to the protest and the larger issue of alleged corruption in the coal mining industry, especially in terms of how it affects Mongolian coal exports to China. Uh, so just to clarify for everyone, a huge part of this scandal was specifically alleging corruption in coal exports to China. So China is sort of a central player in this scandal. Um, Lord, I know you've written a lot about China-Mongolia economic relations. So did you want to start us off? Yeah. So after the allegation has came out and after the protest, I think the foreign ministry uh, released a statement saying that the Chinese side would look into this issue and is willing to cooperate with the Mongolian side. But I don't think they released anything after that. I, at least I haven't, I haven't read anything. Um, but I'm I'm assuming that because it's you know Mongolian state-owned enterprises in a way they have to cooperate you know, but I don't know if you guys have seen anything Julian Anand like any official reports from the Chinese side after the foreign ministry's release of yeah I haven't seen anything either, and I'm assuming even if there is investigation going on I don't think they would like release it you know like hey, you know, this is what we're doing now because they don't usually release their progress. Um, I don't think they will release anything until, you know, 100% sure, like something, some sort of a joint statement from both governments or something like that. Yeah, obviously, uh, China's justice system is uh, not exactly objective, and particularly when it comes to a sensitive case like this in international relations, we have to think that they're probably... Um, going to take other factors that uh, may be keys from the Mongolian government on how to proceed. And they're definitely, as you said before, they're not going to be issuing regular press releases on their progress. Um, but yeah, Julian and Nan, uh, did either of you want to add anything to the, the question of China's role in this? Sure. So uh, again, the, aside from the, the foreign ministry, the, the government, our, uh, our justice minister specifically noted that, that uh, that the Chinese side was not involved in this in, in this crime, uh, and it was actually thanks to the open side of the 
uh, the data that came from China, there was maybe some discrepancies in, in the in the coal export that they found out there was coal theft, uh, but there hasn't been any kind of a, a fact checking on that matter. Uh, if if, the, if what the statements from the justice minister was true, and from what the government is saying that the, actually that the that the Chinese side's uh, information was the source that we found out there was a uh, coal theft in the beginning. Well, I mean, it, it's it's worth bearing in mind, and 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 um, others have referred to this already, right? That uh, this is coal that uh, the entire coal production out of Mongolia is going across the border south to China. Um, the the lignite uh, is going to con keep continue to flow for some years, but ultimately will end as uh, as China is shifting to alternative and renewable energies. Uh, hopefully, for all of us, sooner rather than later. Um, the coking coal is going to remain an export, um, and Inner Mongolia and its large steel production is, is not dependent on Mongolian coking coal, but it's a significant factor. Uh, and so there are concerns also, one would imagine, in the Chinese government that they don't necessarily want their steel companies, if, if they're behind this in the end, engaging in corrupt practices abroad anywhere. Uh, you know, they, they don't necessarily condone that either. And we know that in a twisted way, at least the Chinese regime, particularly under President Xi, has spent a lot of rhetorical attention um, uh, to corruption. Uh, and so it's not entirely uh, in, inconceivable that there's something going on behind the scenes in China as well, where there's certain actors that are being singled out or not. And so that is a relationship. And the, the fact that that the scandal erupted uh, just days after President Hu was, was in Beijing, that as Bola Nana mentioned both that it was a question to the spokesperson for the first, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I mean, there is a little bit of a Chinese angle to all of this. Uh, we might not really ever hear about it, but that is sort of lurking in the background. This is a good segue into our next question. Um, given the virtue of being landlocked and, as we've mentioned, heavily dependent on China in terms of Mongolia's trade, what are the alternative ways to carry its economy other than mining and natural resources? And I know this has been a perennial debate for Mongolia and, frankly, for many other resource-dependent countries. How do you diversify the economy? Everyone knows that it has to be done, but how do you actually do it and what are the, are the alternatives? So who wants to, to talk? Yes, Bolo, I know you've done a lot of work on this. Well, I was going to say what it comes down to is uh, allocation of resources, right? You have an investment comes into your country and whoever is in administration needs to allocate the resources correctly. I think because the mining is kind of easy, you just, you have a state-owned enterprises or a couple of big businesses, so they get the deal and they, you know, they tend to take over. But I think... If, if, if there were more opportunities, like especially nowadays you have, we live in such a modern high-tech industry, there are so many issues that you can solve with if you have the investment. For example, air pollution, traffic. You know, if you have the investment money, build a modern fast train so you actually solve the traffic instead of going into the mining in, in, in different province. You have biomedicine, you have medical issues, you know, Mongolia has so many new diseases and, you know, children having brain, brain disease, uh, what is it, brain tumors. So if you invest in actual life-saving, life-saving uh, projects, then you will actually see, you know, changes and you will see improvement in people's lives versus you're still dealing with the dirty coal and cars and, you know, export, import. So I think if you really want to invest, the problems are there, and they are they are different opportunities. They're they're just they're just not doing it. You know, again, it goes back to allocation of resources, especially uh, for example, like climate change. Everybody's talking about climate change, so if you really care about the environment, solve invest in something like garbage management, fix the sewage. You know, there are so many things that you can do. I think it's an easy way out to invest in mining. This is this is only my take, you know. If you really want to solve something, the issue is there, so you just have to solve it. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to add on, on what Bolo said about allocation of funds is that uh, corruption is very much rampant in Mongolia. And just recently, uh, in, uh, there was a, 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 another scandal of where uh, our railroad, uh, a railway, um, uh, uh, transit uh, government organization that is 
jointly owned, owned, owned by Russia, there was one person who was discovered to have uh, basically um, hoarding o- uh, about $2 million in cash and four different currencies. And uh, that's, yeah, it's very crazy that uh, there would, that would happen. And then, uh, and, and give insult to injuries that the, uh, our, our city mayor um, proposed to allocate about $8 million to improve infrastructure. So just, uh, it's just un- basically on balance where somebody from, from the government who would have that much money in, inside his home and, and the government is talking about spending only uh, about like uh, four times more than that much. So it's just, it, it's just very much an um, imbalance in, in, in how much money is being, uh, where money is going and, and where yeah. the money is being spent and, uh, and where, where they're monitoring who's getting the money or not. So th- that's one of the biggest issues that the allocation of uh, money is not going to the places that it should be. It's yeah. not going to the to the proper places. Uh, and and uh, yes, we can still have our natural resource. We can still do that, but the money is not going to the places that it should be, basically. And what's with these corrupt officials in cash? Just like the vice president of the European Parliament, what's she doing with 800,000 euro in cash sitting in garbage bags at home? What's wrong with these people? Can they invest? Um, obviously, there's significantly things wrong with, with how they behave in any case, but that was another astonishing one. I would just point to two things on this diversity question, uh, diversification question. One is, um, I don't know, it might turn into another uh, lack of diversification, but alternative energy is looming. Uh, this will attract investment from China, no question about it, because China will be buying. And this may turn into an export item for Mongolia. I mean, we, we've got uh, ample sunshine, we've got plenty of territory with some challenges, because obviously lots of other people use that territory. It's not, you can't just plop down a solar collector, but there are opportunities there. We're, we're beginning to talk a bit more about hydro um, this year. That's been on the horizon for some years, but it's getting a bit more active. Um, we've got small wind projects in place, so alternative energy is something of the future. It has similar dynamics to mining in many ways, although probably less of the corruption linked to the government, maybe, who knows, but it would require massive investment in infrastructure um, in, to build a grid. The second piece is one that uh, Frédéric Cotois asked about in the questions as well, which is tourism. Uh, and I'll just use that um, to, to turn to his question, um, right? The government, uh, if you follow um, or the prime minister on, uh, on uh, Instagram, it's all tourism pictures these days, uh, beautiful pictures. It's beautiful country, so no question. Uh, So there is this attempt to attract um, foreign tourists. Um, We've just uh, had a decision uh, last week that an additional, was it 30 or 40 countries are now uh, visa free. Uh, So that is a push. Uh, You know I'll be visiting, um, that's for sure, but I probably don't need any enticement. I'll go on my own. But, uh, you know, in the end, um, as attractive as as tourism is as a form of diversification, it's also quite limited because ultimately um, it is really a, a fairly short tourist season in the summer um, just because of weather um, and um, so the infrastructure is hard to sustain and build up and so um, it, it's not going to be a massive sector that's going to rival other things but it will provide some livelihoods to, to people and it will offer a little bit of diversification at least. Thanks Julian you read my mind that was the question I was going to jump to next. Um, so moving on down our list we have a question for Bowler. Um, to talk a little bit more about SOEs and the questions it raises about Mongolia's free market economic paradigm. So uh, the question is, what do you consider to be the main obstacle in regulating these entities so that they can be more integrated in the overarching economy? Rather than competing with them directly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Can I I take you to a minute on this? Maybe then we can come back. Yeah, I come back. Sure, so we will come back to that one in a second. Let's see, just another one. Uh, we have another question for Julian, if you're up for it, on the your point about the absence of organized civil society organizations. What do you think are the causes of that? Uh, education, lack of interest in politics. And we have another similar question further down about um, historically low voter, voter turnout among the youth in Mongolia. So. Perhaps those are related. Perhaps they're separate. Um, but let's let's try. Let's and, give it a try. Yeah, we'll tackle uh, that issue while Buller is thinking about the the fate of SOEs in Mongolia. 
Terrific. And thanks to Tom and Tiffany and all the others asking the questions. It's great uh, to hear such questions and, and nicely, nicely specific questions, which is good to hear that the audience knows enough about Mongolia to ask specific things. That's great. So um, to Talman's question about uh, civil society, um, I, I was mostly thinking about politics rather than civil society. Um, that uh, in my sense, at least, the political parties uh, have an absence of political organization, even though the membership structures are strong, right? Um, they're, they're clearly, uh, they're vibrant organizations, but they're not organizations that are built around developing political agendas. Uh, and so you see this, um, just to give another example, in Parliament, where most legislation seems to be the pet project of a particular MP who assembles a coalition of people who support um, his or her project, rather than uh, legislation that comes out of a, a party process that says this is direction we want the country, country to be going in. So that's the piece that's that's happening on the political side. And what are its causes? Um, I, it certainly doesn't seem to be a lack of interest in politics because politics does animate a lot of discussions. Um, that doesn't seem to be quite it. I, I'm not sure that it is a lack of education uh, because um, as, as you probably know, basic education is strong in Mongolia. Um, you know, literacy, all those sort of things, access to communication tools, particular online tools is strong. What has happened along the way that has prevented political discourse to move to substance issues. Maybe in part that the Democratic Party that was the longtime opposition party, it's in terrible disarray at the moment, but really through the 90s and, and particularly when it gelled as a party then around 2000 and the 2000 and the 2010s, it was primarily focused on opposing the People's Party rather than offering an alternative vision of how to run the world. And so it was keen on saying that party was the state socialist party, right? They ruled for seven year, 70 years. We want freedom. And it was freedom that they wanted, not a particular direction to take the country in. And so that's how political discourse has been shaped in Mongolia over these past 30 years, I would argue. And that's what, what's then led to um, the sense of a, a closed political system. And maybe that begins to speak to Tiffany's question as well, that... Um, Participation has been low uh, in, in the vote um, for, I mean, there's always complex reasons for that kind of thing. Um, but at the same time, people, are, young people are engaging in these protests. So again, I'd say it speaks to not a lack of interest, uh, but it speaks to perhaps frustration with the nature of the political process that the vote or the, the, the ballot box doesn't feel like a place where a generation or even many individuals get to actually voice their opinion. And that's because the choices they're offered aren't opinion choices, they're people choices. And so I suspect that that there's a lot of the, the reasons for some, what you might think of as apathy when people don't go vote, although of course that's prevalent in many other democracies as well. But some of the reason for that is that the choice that is on offer doesn't feel like an actual choice that determines outcomes for where the country is going. Yeah, I would like to add on the on the, on the youth uh, disengagement in politics is that um, you you see from these protests and from from the April protest there was there was basically young people. I, I see a lot of protests throughout my uh, journalism career, but this was one of the biggest protests and was just very animated and. and <clears throat> And I, I spoke with them and then they would say is that all the, all the people would criticize them like saying, this is what you get for not voting basically. This is what you reap what you sow basically. And what the protests usually would say is that there, is, there isn't a choice. There isn't a choice that they, they can look up to a, a person that they can, who can um, basically um, represent them uh, uh, as, as people. And I, I would ask them, to, like, who, who do you look up to? Who do people, who you look up in Mongolia? And they can't really give a straight answer. And uh, on, on this December protest, there were a few people, a few young people and a few like influential, uh, like local stars, like a, like a comedian who, who, was, um, who was kind of a center of, of this protest, who was trying to uh, uh, rally the, the protesters. And a lot of the young people uh, flocked towards him and, and they they saw that they wanted some kind of a leader that who could represent them and they didn't see that in these uh political uh, like uh, uh votes they, they don't see that they don't see these people as their representatives they don't see 
uh, th these people are voicing their concerns, that the young people have concerns and that the, the politicians in power don't really have their concerns or their back, uh, basically. And that the problems they are uh, talking about are not the problems that the young people are facing, because young people are uh, facing such a different uh, problems because they've uh, most of the young people are, are grew up in this market economy uh, and uh, previously I've never seen people young people work in their uh, when they were 18 now we see young people working in convenience stores at 18 from uh, morning till uh, midnight uh, and we've never seen that in Mongolia so there is a and they, and they don't get paid a, a lot of money and then there's all those things and they, they don't have that uh, they have all these issues and none of the people in politics are voicing those concerns about uh, rights of young people and they're not even looking into it, they're not even engaging into it and they see these problems but they're not talking about it. So of course young people would be very disengaged because they're just very, very little uh, uh, representation of young people in Mongolia. All right, Bular, um, feel free to chime in on this question of uh, youth and political engagement in Mongolia, but then we'll return to the, the question about SOEs and what role they can be playing in yeah. Mongolia's modern economy. So in the last protest, actually, there was, uh, I knew some students who have participated within the protest from the university, you know, National University of Mongolia, and I individually asked them, like, why are you there? It seems to me that there is a different, um, there is a generational difference, and what they want is also different, right? So, you look at it from like 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s generation who wants certain things because they're like around 30s. And the younger generation are 18 and 19, which on inside they grew up in a market economy. They want things right now. But they also know the value of you have to work. But if the opportunity is not there, what are they going to do, right? So, uh, Mongolian Mongolian youths are very educated. They they know the value of education. So everyone graduates high school, they go to university, and everyone wants to leave. Everyone wants to study abroad. But unless you're on scholarship, you don't get to study abroad, right? Or you have the financial capabilities. So when, when young people want certain things and if the opportunity is not there, what do you do, right? You just see it as the government is not providing for them, but as I said, there is a disconnect between what the government is trying to solve versus what they're trying to solve. It just does not land on you know the youth nowadays, but I think there's different generation and wants different things. That's my take. Um, for the SOE question, I think there's a couple, um, couple of conceptual things that we may have to cover. I think one of the main obstacle is probably legal framework. I think Mongolia's legal framework is so complicated. Every administration comes up with new rules and then they cancel the other one or they amend the previous one. So businesses have they have they have such a hard time understanding which one is real or which one you know applies to what. Uh, the second thing is I think it's fiscal health, right? So you have thirty year of semi market economy, but it's still mixed economy because you're not quite. I would say we're still in transition period. I don't see Mongolia as a full market economy because every time you have different administration, the welfare system changes too. So you talk about fiscal health, like what do you get the revenue? So with current administration, the welfare has gone up, right? You have so many social welfare programs for the elderly, for the moms, for the single moms, for the children, for whoever, whoever. Um, but then you don't have the revenue. You see with COVID, the revenue kind of, kind of shut off, right? So what do you get the money? I think Anand said it earlier is that starting February 1st, they're gonna um, increase the price of coal. So the revenue is gonna come from somewhere. So that means you have to balance your welfare system. Otherwise you have all these people dependent on the government giving them financial you know, gifts or whatever every month. And if that stops, then you better have the opportunity so that people can go back to work or replace those things. 
And I think the most important thing is, uh, and Mongolian economist, I'm blanking on, on his name, Inquire, okay? You probably know Anand, right? Uh, economist Inquire talks about this a lot is that Mongolia needs a structural policy reform on its economic policies. And he specifically talks about what the World Bank and IMF have suggested over the years is that they need to separate what is the priority for Mongolia's economy and what needs to be, you wanna have enough fund and revenue for five years, 10 years and 15 and Mongolia just kind of use it up every administration. So I think for one of the main obstacle for deregulating the state-owned enterprises is you want to have fiscal health, not just for this administration, but you know the next, next, the next. Yeah. I hope I hope I answered your question. <laughs> it's it, that could be a topic of a webinar all in itself. So <laughs> I think we did a great job tackling it in the shared space. Um, so I have a question of my own. Uh, we've been talking a lot about how these protests are recurring. Um, you had the protests in December. You also had the earlier protests in April 2022. You had major protests in 2021, um, which resulted in the prime minister stepping down, but he's now the president. <laughs> so I think it's very arguable to what extent past protests have resulted in serious political change in Mongolia, with the obvious exception of the revolutions, um, which Julian brought up in the past. So that's my question is, can we expect to see lasting political change to come out of either the December protests or maybe a future protest movement? Because we've heard a lot about the discontent bubbling beneath the surface that's occasionally erupting. Um, but are there any prospects of really addressing it in a meaningful way? Uh, uh, I would like to answer that. Um, so uh, aside from, from the 1992 pro protest that basically uh, toppled the old, uh, our, and we shifted toward a, a democratic a nation, um, these protests uh, are, are not really uh, achieving much politically because the, because the protest wants something that is, that is very hard to attain, but it's a very uh, big issue that, that needs to be resolved. But it cannot be resolved in, in just a matter of uh, one year or two years. It, it has to be resolved gradually. And, and this is the problem that the current government is facing is that they can do so much and the things that they can do will not really show any substance of change uh, during, the, during the period of uh, Oyurutin's uh, uh, reign, I would say. And, uh, and, and, and for the political side is that uh, if if things don't change significantly, we might see a much a much more violent protest in the future. There have been talks of maybe doing like a snap election, but a snap election will not result in any kind of change towards a, a different a government or a different parliament, because as as Julian mentioned, the the opposing party, the Democratic Party, is in shambles basically, and. They're not in, they're not in the opposition that they used to be, and even if this even if the snap election is legitimate, you know, people will be really angry that that they would have the same government, the same people over again, and and we might see much more harsh, much more violent protests, and we might slide uh, our democracy might might uh, slide back a little bit. So, I don't know how uh, these political uh, protests would change much. Because most of the uh, uh, most of the things they're demanding is is not very substantive, and and as as also Julian mentioned that we don't have a, a civil society that can that has a that can project these um, uh, protests into a meaningful direction that can have good discourse with the government, uh, like for example of a former politician, uh, um, she she wanted to help these protests, to give advice to them, but they shunned her away because they, the, uh, the protesters said, we don't want this protest to be political, <laughs> which, is, which is very ironic or like, it's just, it's, it just shows to, to the mentality of well, what these protests are thinking because they're not, they're not engaged in, in civil societies. They don't understand what protests would do. They, they see these, they want action, but the actions that they, they want is very draconian, very authoritarian. 
and 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 the things that they, they really want that they, they need is not very it, it cannot be attained uh, in, in a matter of seconds or, or a matter of years basically so uh, in, in my thinking is that if things don't change rapidly in some way in some way in, in a good way rapidly and if if something bad happens again and we might see another protest i think this protest would be much more violent because the april protest almost turned violent but the protesters most of the protesters didn't want didn't didn't that didn't let that happen but in this protest few protesters tried to storm the the government palace and they even broke the fence they broke some windows and i think we will see a regression of uh, uh, of the protests if something does not happen soon but uh, uh, as i said you can't change things uh, uh, the, what the things they want it cannot be it cannot be attained uh, in a quick fashion. Oh, I gotta give a I gotta give an optimistic scenario to that dark dark view. <laughs> um, what's that, Paula? I agree with Anand. Oh no, okay, good. So then I'll let me do let me do the advocacy for the for the more optimistic version. And I've got to do that because ultimately, like I like you probably are as well. And I actually I'm sure you are. I'm a committed Democrat. Uh, democracy is where it's at. It's not only the best thing for the world and how to run the world, but it's also the best thing for Mongolia. And so I've got to look for some ways where, of course, democracy, this is one of democracy's strengths. It's able to take into account the public views and public outrage and, and public expressions of where things should go. And so the optimistic version is that this is the second time that corruption has really erupted as an issue. I'd say the, the SME fund was the last time what was that, six, seven years ago? And the public and now a younger generation has put the government on notice as saying, hey, we don't, this is no good. But this really annoys us very much. And it annoys us so much that that I, I think the chance of what uh, Anand is describing in terms of more violent or, or maybe more active protest is, is relatively high. That's how annoyed we are by this. And so it does put government on notice to say, at least watch yourself and at least put that cash in a bank account rather than keeping the bags at home, the bags at home. But so it is a, a way for people to voice frustration. And if some of that frustration turns into more pointed questions during the next election, which, and I think the snap election thing is highly unlikely. So we're really looking at a summer 2024 election. So if some of these protesters are now going to candidates and say, hey, what did you do about corruption? Yeah, I know it's not an immediate fix. And I think Anand is totally right that a lot of the things people are asking for, both the measures they're asking for are mostly scary, but, um, but generally not achieved easily. But what did you do on this? What did you do on air pollution? That was another issue we all took to the streets on. And there has been some action, at least there's been a pretense uh, of action on, on air pollution. And so if that, if some of these questions turn into questions at next election time of even a small subset of the voters, then that's a win because that's a way for the population to voice discontent. Uh, and ultimately they have the choice at the ballot box and they could throw these rascals out as the saying goes. And so there is a mechanism to do that. And so that's the, that's my, my ever rosy uh, hope for the future of Mongolia that, that you know, some of this is managed through democratic expression and reactions. All right, well, we'll let Bowler be the, the voice of doom to end this out. Well, I was gonna say there's there's you know again earlier as I said earlier there's there's a people side and there's a government part. The government would probably look for more political stability, whether it's for keep maintaining in power or just to have some sort of government to, you know, you need a government, right? You can't just be like a bunch of people running around. So, the the current government will still be trying to do, you know, political stability which other smaller parties will try to take their opportunity to establish the political stability. But as Anand said, in that case, we may see a little bit of violence, um, but at some point, the bottom line is democracy it is, is what it is. Any government should be able to take the people's, you know, dissatisfaction, communicate, you know, then find a solution. But at the end, you will still have people and some sort of a government. So. It's important to have that 
space, you know, nonviolent? Do you want to do you want to be able to communicate and discuss and then just find a solution so that everybody's peacefully in existence? Yeah. All right. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get through all of our questions, but that I think is simply a testament to how engaged our audience was and how many great questions we got. So thank you very much for everyone who asked questions. Um, thank you to our panelists for a very engaging and enlightening discussion. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. So we will have to have another Mongolia themed webinar <laughs> in the future. And I hope to see everyone again later. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.